a reading from the Gospel of Luke, the 10th chapter, verses 1 through 9. After this, Jesus appointed 70 others and sent them on ahead of him, two by two, into every town and place where he himself was about to come. And he said to them, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Pray, therefore, the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Go your way. Behold, I send you out as lambs in the midst of wolves. Carry no purse, no bag, no sandals, and salute no one on the road. Whatever house you enter first, say, peace be to this house. And if a son of peace is there, your peace shall rest upon him. But if not, it shall return to you. And remain in the same house, eating and drinking all they provide, for the laborer deserves his wages. Do not go from house to house. Whenever you enter a town and they receive you, eat what is set before you. Heal the sick in it and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. But whenever you enter a town and they do not receive you, go into its streets and say, even the dust of the town that clings to our feet, we will wipe off against you. Nevertheless, know that the kingdom of God has come near. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. As a preacher, I am not married to the lectionary. That's the three-year cycle of readings that is used by the Roman Catholic Church, many Protestant denominations. Mostly, I stopped using the lectionary because as of July 1st, I began my 35th year under appointment as a pastor, which means I have been through the lectionary 11 times and counting now. But there are certain days that I return to the lectionary. If it's a day that's very emotional or things are going on, I tend to go there so I make sure that I'm not going to preach my own agenda. So for February the 3rd of 2019, I decided to go to the lectionary because I knew that was the morning that I was going to be announcing to the congregation of Harmony United Methodist Church in Falling Waters, West Virginia, that I was going to be moving to become the pastor of Epworth United Methodist Church of Cockeysville, Maryland. I understand I was married at Harmony before I served there, and that's where my husband's funeral was conducted, a congregation that will always be near and dear to my heart. We had 11 fruitful years of ministry together there. So I opened to the lectionary that morning to the fourth chapter of Luke's Gospel, and I read these words spoken by our Lord Jesus himself. Truly, I tell you, no prophet is accepted in the prophet's hometown. Let that sink in a moment. <laughs> now at Harmony, we had two different worship services on Sunday, and one was a dialogue sermon. And as soon as those words came out, someone raised his hand and said, aren't you from Cockeysville? Isn't that your hometown? So again, in preparation for this morning, I decided to open the lectionary to pray for the Spirit's guidance about what I was going to say to you for the first time. Everything looked great. Here is Jesus appointing and sending disciples. Not just the 12, but the next batch, 72 this time. They are itinerant preachers. They're proclaiming the nearness of God's kingdom. I was all over that because I'm an itinerant preacher. I was appointed and sent. I was appointed and called and sent a long time ago. My hair was really this color when I was appointed and sent for the first time. And some of you remember Bill Brown. Do any of you remember Bill Brown? He was appointed here. He was 19 when I became his mentor. He is fond of reminding me regularly now that I am going to be the oldest pastor ever appointed to serve Epworth United Methodist Church. <laughs> I could imagine how excited the 72 were. I could just feel how excited they were. Here is Jesus, their Lord, the one they have seen heal and teach and preach and touch people and change their lives, and he's sending them into the world. They were probably on the edge of their seats, just like every United Methodist pastor during appointment season is waiting with the phone in hand for the call. And so, what encouragement, what are the words that Jesus, our Lord, uses as he pushes them out the door into ministry? See. I am sending you out like lambs into the midst of wolves. Well, hello, Epworth. 
I'm back. <laughs> the good news is always the good news is that I'm not in this alone. Bill and I have been called to a specific ministry in the life of the church, to the life and work of an elder and a deacon in the United Methodist Church and in the midst of the congregation. But y'all are called to, that's a West Virginiaism, y'all. Let me make it even more inclusive, all y'all. All y'all have been called to be laborers in God's harvest together. We are all sent. And what are we supposed to take for the journey? Nothing, no sandals. No purse, no bag, no sandals. We're talking in a time when there were dirt roads, no sandals. We're supposed to go ourselves into the world, carrying the gospel, carrying the coming of the kingdom and the nearness of the kingdom in Jesus Christ. Eugene Peterson wrote a rendition of scripture that is called The Message. I usually don't like to read it in the pulpit because it's a little bit foreign, it's a paraphrase, but he puts it in the modern vernacular. And I love what he says, not in this passage, but how he puts it in the call to the original 12 when he sends them into the world. He says, you don't need any extra equipment for this work, you are the equipment. That's why we don't have to take anything for the journey. So let's say that together, you are the equipment. Look at somebody seated next to you. You are the equipment. Look at somebody else. You are the equipment. Now I want you to say it in a way that you really feel it. I am the equipment. Amen. You are the equipment. So here we are together getting ready to go into the world. 72 of us or 172 of us. And we're called to go two by two. We are called to bring the message of God's redeeming love to God's people especially in the congregation, as we read in the letter to the Galatian church, but beyond the walls of this congregation. This is a show that we are meant to take on the road because there are people in the world who are hurting. There are people in the world who are hungry. There are people in the world who are hopeless for what we have in abundance. So we are called to carry this message and Jesus does not soft soap what's going to happen. I love that about him. He doesn't say, come and serve me, and it's just a garden of roses. Come and serve me, and everything is easy peasy. Everybody's going to be happy to see you. Everybody's going to be happy. Every sermon you preach, they're just going to say, amen, 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 preacher. No, Jesus says, I'm sending you as sheep among wolves, and you're going to experience rejection and there are going to be people who don't want to listen to a word you have to say. Aren't you glad things have changed since then? But what are we supposed to do? We're supposed to take the show on the road. We're supposed to go where the people are. We're supposed to go into their homes. It's sort of the reverse of hospitality. Hospitality being crucial from the beginning of God's people through the Old New and into the New Testament, through the Hebrew Bible into the Christian Bible, hospitality is vital. But now we are called to receive hospitality from the people we're going. Our mission team here, you get that, right? You don't know where you're going to stay usually when you go to a place to work. You don't know what you're going to eat, but you're supposed to eat it gratefully. The team in the church that I just left spent year this year in North Carolina in a place called Beaufort, North Carolina. But in other years, they were in the Gulf Coast doing Katrina work. They kept getting stung at night, and they thought there were bees in their bed. No, there were scorpions. And I went on a mission to Japan, not as a missionary per se, but to visit the places that had been set up by the United Methodist Women colleges and universities, hospitals that had been started throughout the world and particularly in Japan. Let me tell you this, I lost 17 pounds in 17 days in Japan because I saw nothing to eat that did not remind me of bait. <laughs> but I was called to eat it. And then the critical moment came when I stayed in a place called the Asian Rural Institute, which is a place that teaches people how to farm with the equipment they have all over the world. They come there to learn how to farm. If they have equipment, they use equipment. If they have nothing but sticks and rocks, they teach them how to farm with sticks and rocks. Let me tell you this. this is a, you're probably going to think, what has happened to us when I tell you this? 
but I had spent 17 days avoiding the use of a Japanese toilet. <laughs> if you've been to Japan, you know what I'm talking about. I won't get any more specific than that. But there I was for 36 hours, and I looked at the clock, and I thought, I bet I can make it. I bet I can make it. <laughs> I couldn't make it 36 hours. And it wasn't just the Japanese toilet. There was a bug the size of Godzilla crawling around the room. But I remembered then that I was there because there are people around the world who have not enough to eat. And so I gratefully accepted one more bowl of miso soup for breakfast and one piece of raw something or other floating in a bowl of seaweed because that was what was provided for me. So when we go to these places, God doesn't want you going on Yelp and leaving a bad comment and looking for the next place to stay. God wants us to accept the hospitality of others which teaches us humility. We will accept and expect and receive rejection sometimes on the road. But what are we supposed to do when we get there, even if they don't want us there, even if they don't want to hear the message we have to say? We're called to leave peace with them. Peace, our peace, not God's peace, our peace. And Jesus says to them, if they don't accept the message that you bring, your peace will come back to you. It will not be lost. It will not be futile. And he says, brush the dust off your feet and go somewhere else. Now, if you remember, the disciples earlier on had said to Jesus, those people over there don't like what we have to say. Call down fire on them. Jesus says, no. No fire, no punishment, no judgment. Just leave your peace behind. Now, I'm sure it feels a little dusty around here sometimes, doesn't it? You've been having what I hear this week, and I sat in the office this week and I had a lot of folks stop in to give me their impressions on Epworth and to welcome me. I appreciate every word of welcome I received. I really appreciate the, the anonymous person who left the chocolate on my desk and the flowers this morning and your welcome and everything else I have received from you has been such a blessing to me. But I've also heard your concerns for Epworth because I know senior pastors seem to come and go very quickly here. I'm your fourth pastoral appointment change since I served my last congregation. And we worry about numbers, don't we? We worry that people have left here and gone to other congregations or some probably have left here and gone nowhere. We get hung up on the numbers, we get hung up on the measurements, but that is not what God is calling us to focus our hearts on. We are to focus our hearts on proclaiming the nearness of the kingdom, the kingdom, the presence and power of Jesus Christ that fills us and informs us. And sometimes you just got to let people go. Not shake the dust off your feet in a way that says, I'm done with you, but to make like a Disney princess and let it go. but we don't do it alone. We never have to do it alone. Jesus knew what he was doing. He didn't send them out individually. He sent them out two by two or 72 at a time because we are called to go the road together. One of my favorite words is the word companion. That's why I call the sermon this morning companionship. What does companion mean? I'm gonna ask you to talk back this morning, something pastors don't usually do during sermons. What does companion mean? Friend. Hmm? Friend. Friend, okay. Friends. Friends are certainly companioning each other on the way. What else, Bill? Someone to share the journey with. Someone to share the journey with. What else? Someone who has your back. You hope so. Companions are those who are put together and usually for a journey. Companions are people who walk with each other and who spend time with each other. And usually on a journey, as I said, how many of you have ever been on a car trip? How many of you ever been on a car trip with teenagers or children? <laughs> how many of you have been on a car trip yourself and you haven't been the best company in the world? <laughs> My friend Wayne is here this morning. He and I drove together to a retreat in New York last year. I was pumping the brake, but I wasn't driving. <laughs> so 
Sometimes when you're on a journey together, you get a little antsy, you get a little nervous, you want to stop. Somebody wants to go faster than someone else. Someone needs to use the restroom. Someone else is in the back seat going, are we there yet? 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 I'm not sure the exact location we're going to go together, but I know we're going to go together. I know we're going to go together. And I was an English major before I went to seminary. I am fascinated with the way words come to be. The word companion comes from two Latin words, com and panis. Com panis. Same root for a company or company. And you know what it means? It means traveling with bread together. Companions at the root of the word are people who share bread together. We're going to share bread after the service. I'm going to get to see what good cooks y'all are. Y'all again. What good cooks you all are. <laughs> I'll, I'll get back to 23 years in West Virginia. You've got to give me a break sometimes. I find myself saying the word, would you like some pie? And then I say, oh, it's pie. Pie. P-I-E is pie. But more than that, we're going to share the bread of the presence and power of Jesus Christ. We're going to share the bread that strengthens us and makes us who we are, that defines us and joins us together, not just here, but the folks who are celebrating Holy Communion all over the world right now, some later, some before us. We're going to be companions on the road fed by the bread of God together. Paul wrote to the church, the Galatian church, kind of to fuss at them, if you really want the truth. Because the new church was gathering people from all different parts of society. Some had been slaves. Some may still have been slaves. Some were free. Some were very wealthy. Some had enough to get by on. Some were very poor. Some were educated. Some didn't have any education at all. And they were coming together and they were doing inside the church what was happening in society. They were making distinctions and Paul says, no, cut it out. We are all together bearing one another's burdens. That's why we sent that team to North Carolina. That's why we're gonna be at the Baltimore County work camp. That's why we're having vacation Bible school. That's why you bring in food that gets shared through UCAN and other ministries of the church, because that's who we are in the name of Jesus Christ. We are those who have been called and equipped and appointed and sent into the world to tell people that in Jesus Christ, the kingdom has come near and it's in us and it's going to live through us. So that's why he wrote let us not grow weary in doing what is right, for we will reap at harvest time if we do not give up. So then, whenever we have an opportunity, let us work for the good of all, especially those of the family of faith. Us and we, he says, not individuals, but companions on the journey. Those who keep company with one another, those who break bread together. I can't tell you what's going to happen. I can tell you I'm going to commit to being here as long as you're going to have me. I'm not going to ask to leave anytime soon. You may feel otherwise, but that's up to you. I can't promise you that I'm never going to upset you. Ask my parents, can I be annoying? <laughs> my mother is too sweet to say yes, but trust me, they haven't always liked everything I've done, even recently. But I can promise you this that together we will serve Christ. We don't know the fate of the United Methodist Church. Some of you are waiting to see where I am on that side, either side of that issue or other issues. I know for some people you're as good as your first sermon or your last mistake. I know that some of you are hoping that your next pastor would be a man. I know that because I've done this a long time. I know some of you came this morning thinking, what is going to happen next? We don't know, but we can commit ourselves afresh and anew to being companions at the table, sharing the bread of Christ, and that we will say yes when God says, go there, go there with your peace, 
Go there with the presence and power of your Savior. Go there in my name, and God will be with us. Because if we do all that, we will be the companions with Christ. What good company we are in together. And for my appointment here, for working with Bill, for working with the leaders, we're working with the laity, the youth, the children here, I give thanks and praise to God my Savior. Amen. We're going to 